Das ist wegen Doing Abwehr. Nee. Ah, no. It's trying something. Yeah, was? Use these We can try that, yes. Okay, thanks. So, is this here? On the side, yeah. Something happened. Yeah, nice. Okay, let's try that one. Good. Uh, but I have to switch in on mirroring this place. So, apply. E J -H. Okay, here's my list of what I wanted to show you. Let's see if it makes any sense to me, if I look a bit more. So you might have seen, or maybe not yet, I put a link in the Moodle, um, that I have now uh, worked a bit in the last week trying to put together our lecture notes of the previous thing and clean them up a bit and get stuff in it. And I quickly go through them with you so that you, uh, that we see, because I added a few extra things that I've forgotten last, that I hadn't noticed during the lecture, and uh, which still might be relevant. So let's have a look at this. So as you might remember, in the first lecture, we just looked at the server clustering tutorial. So I just put the link back. And then in the second cluster, we try, in the second lecture, we try to do all this manually by just without using server or something like this. And uh, the one thing I added here is to uh, put in an, a proper explanation of what the experiment was about. So if you've forgotten, you can look through them again here. And then I also had a bit a look at uh, how actually the data comes. And you remember last time we just used the read10x and the way how the data is actually uh, is actually uh, um, shown is that you have always these two um, directories, the filtered and the raw barcode matrix. And the raw is just all the droplets, and the filtered is only those droplets which have a reasonable number of UMIs. And we keep this and uh, this reasonable, and uh, it's usually shorter, and so that's why we always use this. But sometimes you want to look into the raw because the filtered one might have kicked out too much. And here in the filtered one, I'm not sure if I've showed you this, is we have uh, these three files, the big file with the actual values of the matrix, and then two files which give you the row and the column annotations. For example, uh, the row annot uh, the column annotation are just the barcodes of the files, and the row annotations are the actual are the genes. And um, you get these things like, a, and it's typically it's three columns, the gene ID, the name of a gene, and then the fact that it is a gene and not a multiplexing tag. And multiplexing tags, I think I've mentioned, was what this, was this hashtag that we put onto it. And in case you ever want to read something like this in with R without the use of server, I've shown you here how to do it. Namely, uh, that you read this big matrix file here, this, this one here, and it always has three columns, the row, column, and the actual value. So this means row 10, column 1 has the value 1, and this here on top is the total size of the, of the matrix, how many rows and columns and non-zero values it has. And there's this sparse matrix function in R, which is part of a matrix package, where you can simply give it the list of rows and columns and data values, of course always omitting here the first line because that contains this stuff, and then you can make this, uh, assemble this matrix that way. And then, of course, set the row names and the column names according to the other two files. So that's what I showed in this one. And then I made here this clustering tutorial where I went through our clustering and nearest neighbor graph again. 
And as you can see here, this was the clustering of our data, putting it in many different clusters. And now it's the thing that I wanted to, uh, was this here already? Uh, there's two things I wanted to jump in a bit more. Uh, the first thing is, Ah, here, this is why it didn't make sense. I skipped over that one, sorry. So, yeah, for the dimensional reduction, there was one thing I skipped over, and I wanted to uh, to now come back to this because we will need it later. And that's a little bit of math, not too complicated. But uh, so you remember we, we uh, write in all the counts when looked, calculated for each a uh, cell or for each column in the matrix, the column sum in the following, I will always call this the total and abbreviate it with S or sum of all of them. And this total here, you see here, and we've said back then that uh, this must be the real cells in this left peak, which has been cut off by the filtering. That must be uh, just the empty droplets which contain some ambient RNA. And we've cut here at the green line. And uh, when we normalize by dividing each count value by the total count of a respective cell so that we change it from counts into fractions, which sum up to one, as you've seen here. And then uh, later, we looked at the, uh, and we took the logarithm of these plus one. And then later to do our PCA, we wanted to look into highly variable genes. Because if we calculate the PCA on this big count matrix with the 20,000, uh, with the, if it's 20,000 or 30,000 genes, it simply would take ages because these PCA algorithms run quadratically in the size of a matrix. So, uh, what we uh, instead did is that we tried to find, find those genes which differ strongly from cell to cell in order to, uh, to uh, be informative. And the idea here is that we know that our data is strongly influenced by Poisson noise. So if a gene only has, um, if, uh, uh, if a gene has the same expected fraction over all the cells, we will still see a sizable variance simply because what we really do is we imagine this as a multinomial sampling, sorry, as a binomial sampling. We have our, we have our total of S reads in the cell and of which we want to, to uh, of which K, uh, a certain fraction phi is from this, um, from this uh, one, and you write it onto it. So let's say Q, is the expected fraction of this uh, Q is the expected fraction of uh, of uh, this gene among all the reads that we get from the cell, and so an S I, let's say K I is uh, of gene of interest. And let's say chi, k, I, I use j always for my cells out of tradition. Uh, and kj is the uh, read count. For the gene in cell uh, j. And then we have, of course, sj, which is the sum over all the other genes. which is the total count, again, for cell J. And uh, what we now model is that we say that KJ is a, is, a, is a random variable, which is binomial distributed uh, by, uh, uh, by taking all the SJ reads and taking from them a fraction Q. And we can approximate this as KJ follows a Poisson distribution with SJ uh, Q. Because you know a binomial distribution can be approximated with a Poisson uh, whenever the rate parameter Q is small compared to one. Everybody familiar with that? 
Um, boop, boop. How do we quickly explain? Is everybody familiar with the Poisson distribution? So for now, let's just say the Poisson distribution is our, we just consider it for today as an approximation of a binomial. So this means the binomial is clear. We have a big bag of SJ balls of which a fraction Q is red and all the remainder is yellow. And binomial distribution means if what is the probability to get K uh, red one, ah, sorry, to do it slightly different. And actually, mm, uh, let me explain it the other way around when we avoid the binomial. I just claim now that it's from the beginning. It is Poisson distributed. And my argument is uh, the following. We imagine the cell to be a giant bag or an urn. You know, statisticians always like to think of urn models, which are uh, big bags with balls which we pull out, like in the lottery pulling, without ever doing something. And this thing contains maybe a few hundred thousand of these, uh, of these cells. 100,000 uh, mRNA molecules. And a fraction Q of them, Q is from my gene of interest, the gene I'm currently looking. So I imagine these ones are marked red. The others marked in, are marked in other colors for the other genes, but we don't care of them. And when we sample from this cell, we only get something around 1,000 or 2,000 reads. So we pull. Sample 2,000 reads. And we now ask, what is the uh, pro probability that we get K reads, that K of the balls are red, if we would put 2,000 balls, if we pull 2,000 balls out of this big thing with 100,000, of which 10% are red. So let's say this is 100,000, 1% of these 100,000 balls is red. We pull 2,000 out of them. This is called a hypergeometric distribution, and you can, you might remember from high school, that's this formula with the three binomial coefficients, two on top, one at the bottom, and what you always do if you, if you have to do the standard textbook question of what is the probability to get, uh, to get six right ones in, in the lottery. So, uh, the first thing you can observe is that this number doesn't really isn't really important as long as it's big. If I would replace this, uh, this 100,000 by a million, it wouldn't change. This is because it, the number is important if it's small, if you only have, to, uh, have 100 or so, because then if you take one ball, you change the fraction, because then there is one less white or one less red. This is why if you want to calculate exactly, you have to take out a ball, say it's white or red, and then you have to adjust the fraction because now there's one less white or red ball. But if the number of balls which you take out is much higher than the number of balls in here, then this fraction doesn't change. So we can, in a way, only if a fraction is important, and this is completely irrelevant. So what we actually do is we ask, uh, how many balls do we get? What's also more or less irrelevant is how many reads we actually get if we are only interested in the fraction. Because the expected number is now Q times 2,000, and the noise around this is something else. And if you now do the variance, if you now uh, calculate this, you will find that the distribution of the number of, of red balls, which we pull out of this, uh, that, which we have among our 2,000 sampled reads, uh, only depends on uh, this, on the expected number. The expected number is Q of Q times 2,000, so 20 if Q were 0 .00, 0 0.001, and it only depends on that. And how it depends is exactly the Poisson distribution, which we can simulate with our, uh, which we can actually easily simulate in R by just saying R plus, and let's now say we want to, to uh, uh, we want to have, we say there's 0.1 times 2,000, and then you get here these numbers, 
And I can do this a lot of time and draw a histogram. And it looks like this. Now, the crucial point, the Poisson is a one-parameter distribution. It's only dependent by this expected number of things. And everything else follows from it. Crucially, not only the height of the value follows it, but also the width. We know that the mean is at 20, and we know that the width of this thing, the standard deviation, is square root of 20. Because in Poisson distribution, the mean is all, the variance is always proportional to the mean. And this fact has, is absolutely fundamental for everything we do in this single cell because it tells us about how precise we can measure things. We have here a gene which in this cell has a fraction which corresponds to getting 20, but it is quite likely to get 30 or to get only 10, which gives us an intrinsic minimum variance that we should see. And this minimum variance, and if the actual variance that we observe for the gene is much, not much higher than this minimum variance, then we know that this gene cannot give us any information to, to distinguish, to say anything about the biology of the cells. Because obviously this gene has actually the same Q in all the cells, and only later it, uh, it becomes uh, larger. So this is what we now here have. We have this Q, and for the start I say here, I assume that QJ depends on this, on this cell. So KJ given this QJ is Poisson. But the QJ itself might now also vary from cell to cell. And this variation is what we are actually interested. Maybe the distribution of the Qs is bimodal and it allows us to split the cell into two halves. It could be CD3, which is, has one mode close to zero for the non-T cells and a mode much further up for the second T cells. So we want to actually know the variance of this Q. And in the easiest case, the variance of this Q might be very close to zero. And then we are dominated by Poisson noise. So the overall, the total variance of this KJ, so we can say the variance of KJ given QJ is um, the variance of KJ given QJ is, um, as we've just said, no, SJQJ. Is the same as the expectation of KJ given SJQJ, namely just the value itself. So this is the crucial point here. Uh, the variance of the, of the count, uh, if we are given this Q and we only look at the sampling variance due to this Poisson effect, is the same as the expectation, namely simply what we expect, SJQJ. However, the variance of the total thing, variance of KJ as a whole, is, and now comes something which is called the Total, the law of total variances, which I quickly put onto the uh, law of total variance. Put onto the screen so you can all see it up here and check that I do it right while I write it on the board. And What I now do, I will quickly change my writing here. And you know, in statistics, we usually use capital letters for random variables, and we use small letters for uh, constants. So I make this a capital letter because we can now consider Q, the expected fraction, is a random letter. Only SJ, the size of a cell, we consider a constant. And so I make all this now a QJ, a capital thing here. So, and now we want to have, want to know what's the variance of KJ as itself. And the variance of a random variable which depends on another random variable has to be calculated by taking these two things. We first calculate the random variable, uh, we first cal calculate the expectation of the variance and the variance of the expectation. It looks a bit weird, but if I write it down, it will become pretty clear what this means. So we start off 
by saying the expectation of the variance of kj given sjqj plus, uh, and now the other way around, variance of the expectation of kj given alt kj given qj. So what does this mean? Let's look at the mini thing. What is the variance of kj given qj? Well, we've already said if, uh, if kj, uh, let's start on that side, that's easier. If we are given qj, we know the expectation of the counts. If we know what the fraction is in the cell, we know what the expectation of the count is, namely simply qj multiplied by the total number of cells. This is the fraction, this is the total, so this is the expected number of counts. The variance in this case is easy because this is a Poisson, and a Poisson, the variance and the expectation, the variance and the expectation is equal. So this is also QJ, SJ. And now we just have to take the expectations of this. So we simply say, we simply now have to say something about how QJ is distributed. So let's say QJ is, uh, as we said, tells us how strong, the, what the fraction is among many different cells. And it has an expectation. So let's say a QJ has an expectation, which we simply now call Q. So this is the average expression, average over all the cells, while the QJ is the expression strength in the individual cells. And we have a variance of QJ uh, which we call sigma squared because this is just the standard deviation and because I have sitting here variance x squared. So with this I can now make my continue what I have down here and say the variance of this kj is the expectation of qj sj plus the variance of qj sj. So what's the expectation? The expectation of qj is q and this is just the constant. So if we know if this is uh, so if we know that we ever the expected fraction over all the cells is q, then the expected counts for our specific cell that we now have is of course the size of this cell times q. And for the variance, now we have to be careful because this here is a constant. In the expectation, I could simply pull the constant out of the, out of the E. But in a variance, if you pull a constant out before the variance symbol, it gets squared. Because the variance, as you remember, is everything squared. So this is then SJ squared times Q. And what we are often interested is in Uh, sorry, SJ squared times sigma squared, thanks. I just was thinking something looks wrong, yeah. So exactly, this here is the variance of Q and we have to S pull the SJ here. So what people like to do is we are interested in the precision. If we take a, uh, if we, uh, if we look at the, um, if, let me think for a moment. Uh, if we look at something like here, my example for a, uh, for my uh, histogram here, I said this histogram had variance 20 at standard deviation square root of 20. Often you're interested in something what is called the coefficient of var variation. The coefficient of variation is simply the standard, division, uh, the standard uh, division divided by the mean. So we divide this 20 here by the square root of 20, four and a half or so, and say, so the precision here is four and a half over 20. So this value is what's four and a half over 20, let's say about 3.3. So we can say this value has a precision of about plus minus 30%. In this, if you give a precision of a, of a value, uh, by plus minus so and so many percent. That's what we call the coefficient of variation. 
And this coefficient of variation of our kj is now, of course, the standard deviation, variance of kj squared, divided by the expectation, which is sjq plus sj squared sigma squared, divided by, and what's the expectation? The expectation is, of course, sjq. Strictly speaking, uh, when I calculated the expectation, I should have used the law of total expectation, which is exactly the same thing as which just tells you you first have to take the expectation over the over the uh, k, uh, over the k, and then the expectation over the whole thing. But it's easy to see that you get this. The reason why I make this calculation is because if we now divide this out, when we get here sj over q, we get, uh, I'm missing a square somewhere. Is this possible? Coefficient of variance. Uh, uh, what I do, I think what I, I'm missing my square root here. So what I will do is I take the square of this coefficient of variance and put a square here. The reason why I do this is uh, if I take the square root, then I have to take here the square root of the sum, and that's ugly. Uh, but if I don't take the square root of the sum, I can write this now. And now I, I split this thing, and I get 1 over q. No. 1 over sjq plus, and now I have here sj squared cancels, and sigma squared over q squared. So what is this? This is the Poisson noise, and this here is the uh, biological variance. What does this tell us? Here, this part here is the Poisson noise in the sense that uh, you see here at the bottom, this is just the expectation of our counts. If we expect 10 counts, then this tells us that the precision we can expect is square root of one tenth, which is exactly what I've shown you here. If we, expect, if we expect a width of 20, we get this. And this year, the biological variation, this is just sigma over q, so just how much relatively in percent the, exp the uh, expression of this gene varies biologically from cell to cell without it. And that's crucial because it tells us that whenever we calculate uh, we try to find out the expression of a gene by looking at the counts we get, we deviate from the true value by, uh, by a noise which is, can be split into two parts. One part which is just due to the Poisson process that we are only looking at a small sample, and one part which is the actual biological variance. And that part is of course the biology, while this part here, it depends on uh, on the counts, how many we get. So if we have a gene with only 10 counts, uh, then, we've, then it's probably that part will dominate and that part will be small. And we always need to know which of these parts dominates the thing. If they are about the equal size, it's not, uh, we have to consider both. But if we only, if this part is much larger than this part, then uh, we can say this gene is Poisson dominated or short noise dominated. That means we cannot actually say anything about its variation. We can only say that the biological variation is probably much smaller than the short noise, but if that noise is very large, then we, it doesn't say much. While here, if the biological variance has the higher, has, uh, is the higher term, then we can say, okay, we can tell we can actually tell from the counts whether this cell is on a rather high end or a low end of a distribution of actual expression values. And 
when we uh, when we calculated our PCA, we looked at this for the first time, and we said we want to use only those genes in the PCA where this value is reasonably high, while and that value is not so high. So what I did back then is. Uh, we made this plot here, where, as you can see, most of the genes sit here on a straight line. Actually, here it splits up a bit in two lines, but that was only because we didn't kick out the bad ones. But otherwise, they would really, often they really sit all nicely on this line, and then there's a population of cells which sit on top of it. Note that the y-axis here is the variance over the means. So if I now look at this, Variance over the means, uh, this is not exactly what I've written here, but that is variance uh, kj no, over ekj is sjq plus sj squared q squared over sjq and now without the square. And if I write this, I get 1 plus SJQ. And you can already see if we do this variance over the Q, if a Poisson noise dominates, it always gives 1. And if, we, if the other noise, and if this thing has an appreciable effect, when we get above 1. So these are all the values where this gives 1, and these are the values which sit above there. Now, uh, you might wonder, but it, it doesn't sit with one. It actually sits at where this blue line is. And I've put this blue line at exactly the average of one over s. Well, how does this now happen? Well, uh, in my formula so far, I always talked about the variance of kj. But when we did this here, what you see is we took the row with the variance of frax. So the variance of kj over sj. And we want to know the expectation of this thing. And or strictly speaking, we don't want to make the expectation of this thing, but we want to get the expectation of a sample variance of this. So the expectation of uh, So how do you calculate a sample variance? 1 over n minus 1, sum of kj over sj minus 1 over n j, j prime, kj prime over sj prime, like this here. And now, this gets a bit of tedious calculation because we have here the double sum and we want to do an expectation. Uh, those of you who feel the, uh, who feel the urge to, to uh, hone their mathematical symbol manipulation skills can try this as a homework. And I did it the last time. It filled about two pages and I made about five mistakes, but at the end I went, God, that this is... 1 over n, 1 over sj. And that's the kind of uh, mathematics you have to sort of, which uh, sits at the background of things like this plot here. So before I clean all this, maybe I make a little picture of my uh, board. Not that it's so good, but otherwise my recording is completely useless because... Uh, I only see myself, that's not good. So, originally when I, when I conceived this lecture, uh, of course, this, uh, as I mainly wanted to advertise it for the math people, I expected to do much more of this kind of stuff. 
Uh, and now we are not so many mathematicians, but I thought this is a fundamental thing I skipped over it last time, so let's put it in you. I imagine that it's a bit, it's not something that you're too familiar, maybe even Andreas was not exactly a, a statistics person, is used to this kind of calculations, but uh, that's the stuff that we need to do there. Because it's an expectation. And there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is uh, that's what I put here. As you can see, uh, we are, what we've calculated here, this is not the minimum, it's the expectation of this thing. Uh, sorry, for this would be the expectation is, I haven't cleared it for uh, sigma gleich, I should say it's greater equal, and it's equal if sigma is, uh, if sigma squared is zero. So if you have only Poisson noise, it's this, otherwise it's more. Um, why exactly? It's an expectation. So if you were, if you had infinitely many cells, then all the, then nothing would be below the blue, blue line. But given that we don't have infinitely many cells, uh, not the. Uh, That's why on the left, those with low means, because what we now could do, we could also calculate the variance of this variance estimator. And the variance of this variance estimator, we would find that it depends on the mean. And this is why the mean to the, why to the left, we see more variance. There's also a thing that I said at the beginning that I consider the overall size of the cells as a constant, which I think is justified because, um, uh, because uh, it doesn't influence things, but I have some lingering doubt that it might not be the case. What one can do if one wants to understand something like this is to write a simulation, because here I now use the real data. What I could do instead is that I simulate data according to this. So I, I find some random, uh, um, some random distribution for the Qs. I have to decide on one. And traditionally, one typically uses a log normal for the Qs. And because why do we use a log normal? Have I ever explained this? So in biology, we assume uh, typically in statistics, we assume that everything which has depends on many independent causes is normally distributed due to the central limit theorem. Everybody familiar with that? And the central limit theorem t says us that as the sum or the average of a, of, uh, of a collection of many independently distributed random variables is normal distributed or converges to a normal distribution. Crucial word here is sum. If you have many causes and they all have an additive effect on the final thing, uh, then uh, we expect their stuff to be normal. However, in biology, most things contribute multiplicatively. You know this from chemistry where you have a mass action law, which tells you that the reaction speed is the product of the concentration of the adducts and uh, divided by the product of the concentration of the, uh, of the products. Sorry, the division is only if you can calculate the equilibrium. So everything we have in, in biology is, of course, applied chemistry in a way. Everything which happens in a biological system is governed by chemical equations, and chemical equations are governed by the mass action law, which tells us that all influences are multiplicative. And because of this, the Central limit theorem holds in biology, but not for the values themselves, but for the logarithm to turn the mass action law from a sum into a product, from a product into a sum. And this is why everything in biology seems to be uh, log normally distributed rather than normally distributed. For things like body height, which is not, uh, this is not so noticeable because there's regimes where you can hardly see the difference between a normal and a log normal distribution. But uh, for other things like gene expression, you notice that it has this immense tail going out. Gene expression can vary between having one 
one RNA uh, per million, 10 RNAs, 100,000 RNAs. Usually things vary over orders of magnitude. That's why whenever we simulate something in biology, we assume a log normal distribution. Using this log normal distribution, we just come up with something for our log normal distribution, some mean and some variance that determines our thing. When we draw for our thousand cell these things, when we need size factors, so total cell sizes, by the way, how are our total cell sizes distributed? If we look at the real data, what is the distribution of the SJs? What kind of distribution function would you use for that? Let's have a look here at this, at this histogram of things. Well, it's not exactly normal. I mean, it seems to be a bit too lean for it. I have a feeling a real normal would be a bit rounder on the top and a bit slimmer here. But it would be not completely wrong to consider this a normal distribution or to replace it with a normal for a rough simulation. However, remember that I took the log before, play, before uh, drawing the histogram. So again, also, our cell sizes are a typical, uh, a typical uh, instance of this log normal distribution, which is so ubiquitous in all biology and biotechnology. So this way, sorry. Yeah. Why did we compute that? Uh, we wanted to understand here uh, we wanted to understand uh, first how well we can expect fractions. So whenever we look at a count value, you remember at the, at the beginning, uh, we load our count value where we see, for example, the gene XFR4 has five counts in this cell. And by itself, this doesn't tell as much because uh, we, because as we've just said, the total number of human eyes we get from each cell varies so much. So we should, we should calculate the total for this cell and divide these counts here by the total of the cells, which gives us a fraction. And exactly, and I've written K for the number we read off here, and I've written, I've written S for the cell totals. I think S said, wrote this up here where we set here. So S is the, just the sum of his case for a given cell of all the genes so that afterwards, and that was the point that I should have written, that when KJ over SJ is the observed fraction. It, the, the reason why we want to look at that is now that we want to understand if we look, if we take one gene and look at this gene at many cells, and in order to be able to compare across all these cells, we divide the value for each cell by SJ. So we look at many fractions. And now we want to know how much variance we see. And we want to know whether the variance we see actually tells us something about that the cells actually differ in this or whether it tells us something about uh, technical issues. And that's what we see here. This is the variance due to the technical effect because we imagine that there is first the biological difference in the actual fraction from cell to cell. One cell might be in a state where it needs more of this gene. Another cell is in a state where it needs only a little bit of this gene. So we can conclude from the cell having more of the gene that it is doing something for which it needs the cell. So this tells us something about whether this, uh, it tells us something about what the cell is doing. But it tells us something only if this difference that we see due to the two cells is really due to a biological difference in in, uh, in QJ and not due to the Poisson noise, which is added when we get from Q to K. So this is sort of our idea that we have this thing like Q and sigma squared just describes how the cell varies between all these cells. And from this, we get for each individual cell a QJ. 
which tells us how much is. And from that, we get our counts. And we say, this is biology. And this is technology. The differences between the QJ tell us something about biological difference between the cells. And this is just the distribution across the things which are biologically possible. And the variation here within this distribution is considered meaningful. A cell with high QJ is doing something else with a cell with low QJ. While the variation which is introduced by this step is merely due to the technological limitation of our experimental setup. And this is why it's so important to be able to, to uh, tell for a difference between two cells whether this difference is biological meaningful because it's caused by this term or whether it is merely technical noise and hence caused by, because it's caused by this term. Makes more sense now? By increasing the SJ, exactly, which is also important. It means that we can make much better biological statements about the cells from the right flank of this distribution than about the cells from the left flank, which is important because uh, there is a reason to think about uh, whether we actually want to whether, uh, so this is why usually when people do an experiment, the first thing they look is is that histogram. If, if uh, the values are too small, you say, okay, we can't do anything about that. We essentially, typically a good rule of thumb is you want to see at least 2,000 genes for, uh, you want to see at least 2,000, 3,000 counts to be able to, uh, to get good information about it. And you see, 2,000, 3,000, that's about here. So this is actually a good experiment, but often the whole thing is shifted a bit to the left. And you look at it and say, ah, this was crap. Let's do it again. More questions on that? Yeah. Where we see this here in practice, we could. We can simulate some data. We can also look at our actual data and take a gene and check for each gene how much it is. But what we can now here do to come back to why we did the whole thing, if we look at this thing here, where you remember the y-axis is, sorry, is that thing. Um, and use blackboard for so long, I forgot the mechanic of them. So here we can now see that these dots here on top, they are the genes right, where we can actually make useful information and these aren't. And of course we can already learn biology for that. We might, for example, take this gene here, which probably has the highest biological expectation of them all, and have a look at what gene is it. And look at these top genes which sit here. Here, yes, remember, I then took the thousand highest genes and made them red. And we can already see here how they are sorted. And the gene which has here the highest thing at all is, as you can see here, hemoglobin HBBS, which is, let's look it up, a hemoglobin beta chain, uh, no, well, uh, beta. I keep forgetting how is hemoglobin, but it's part of a of hemoglobin. Now, uh, this is something which you often have when you look at, at samples. The highest, the gene with the highest variance is hemoglobin. And or is one of the hemoglobin is a protein complex made up of four subchains, and this the beta chain is one of them. And if you remember, this were supposed to be neurons. And uh, in neurons, you're not supposed to have any hemoglobin. On the other hand, blood is everywhere. Biology is a bloody business. You have everything contaminated with blood. And erythrocyte, usually, if you look at the actual values of these fractions, what are typical values of these fractions? Let's look at that for a moment. Uh, where are we here? As you can see here, typical gene fractions are... Um, Typical gene means are here 10 to the minus 2 is the highest. Uh, so 
that a gene makes up 1% of all the RNA is extremely high. Typical genes make up one in a million or one in 100,000. Uh, but there's a few specialized cell types which are so specialized with only one job that they use all their gene expression capacity to produce just one kind of RNA, which then really fills about half of the cells. And the most famous example is erythrocytes, red blood cells. Their only job is to make hemoglobin and use it to transport oxygen. So if you se sequence hemoglobin, you uh, get, if you sequence hemoglobin, if you sequence red blood cells, you find that they are stock full of hemoglobin genes and there's hardly anything else. Um, typically, erythrocyte contains something like 50% hemoglobin genes. Our hemoglobin makes only one in 100,000, but that's only because we are not supposed to have any erythrocytes. The few stray erythrocytes which got into our sample and which shouldn't be there, they alone managed to crank up the hemoglobin level so high. And of course, because if we now look at the hemoglobin, Unfortunately, I don't have the data loaded, otherwise I could show you how at the bottom of the, uh, how at the, uh, how uh, for hemoglobin, if you look at the histogram, you say it has zero counts in 99% of the cells and thousands of counts in a very small number of cells, which are these leftover erythrocytes. Even more worse, the erythrocytes, because we actually don't want them, they tend to break up, and so this HPC gene flows around everywhere, and so a bit of it gets into every droplet, and this is why you see this always. So in practice, it turns out that the top genes here, they are actually not that biologically useful. Once you look at them, they are all debris from cells which you don't want. The stuff which really contains the biology is this area here, a bit lower. And these also in here, this at the bottom, these are these here to the left. These are now, of course, genes where, where we don't get above the Poisson noise because the Poisson noise is so strong, because the Q is so low, the red this tires is low. While those here to the right, they have a high enough mean, so the Q is large, and nevertheless, we don't manage to get. Uh, they don't show any information. So these are genes which are highly enough, ex whose expression is strong enough to act so that we actually should be able to see differences between cells, but we still don't see any differences because there aren't any. Now for the biologist, how do we call these genes that are the same in all the cells? Exactly. So these are the, so these are the genes which are too weak because they are uh, too strong to weakly express maybe transcription factor and so on. They, they might contain a lot of useful information, but they are too weak. These are the housekeeping genes. They are boring because they are the same everywhere. And these are the genes which are informative and help us to do our PCA. And this is why we now go on with these genes. Here the genes on top, we might even check out, but we just leave them in. And this is how we went in to perform the PCA, but I wanted to go back with, to this plot because as we've just seen, there's much more to that plot than just selecting genes to put into the PCA. It really tells us about the information content of our data, where we have how much information. So, more questions on that. And I probably should write all this math down properly in nice LaTeX at some point. Or maybe I'll find somebody who does it for me. So, and when we calculate our distances, and for the cell-to-cell -cell distances, uh, and did our UMAP, and got a nice other UMAP, and then we switched over to this clustering. <laughs> and in this clustering, you remember, we made a nearest neighbor graph. For each cell, we found their nearest neighbors in PCA space. Again, PCA space, and that's also something I want to come back at, but I haven't prepared this for today, so we'll do this next, uh, uh, next week about what a PCA really does and how we can understand it as an autoencoder. And we also should talk about how these uh, Poisson noise messes up our PCA.
and what we can do about that. But for the moment, we now take our PCA for granted. We assume that we, we remember we have now, before we had this long vector of counts for each cell, now we have pulled down these long vector of counts to a shorter vector of maybe uh, uh, 30 principal component dimension, and we take the Euclidean distance between these to find out for each cell which cells are similar to them. And then we make this graph where we contact, connected each cell with its 20 nearest neighbors. And, um, and then we use this graph to do a Leiden clustering. And in the Leiden clustering, we have in the UMAP, now this we call here cluster or communities, and these communities are cells which are all close to each other uh, in the sense of a neighboring graph. And I already mentioned this a bit last time, this whole thing comes more from research on sociology and so on, looking at Facebook graphs, and the other thing we want to find densely connected clusters. So something like uh, if we have a uh, if we have cells like this, uh, if we would have, if these would be Facebook accounts and each connection is a friendship, we would say, okay, these are two friend groups and we can split it here and we can say this is one group of friends, this is another group of friends. And if we want now to decide whether this is a good way of splitting the thing into two parts, one thing that we can do is to, let, to count the edges, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine connection, and ask how many of these edges stay within one community. And we say eight of these nine edges stay within the community, only one edge crosses a community border. And that's what the Leiden algorithm does. It tries out many different assignments of cells to clusters until it finds one which minimizes this thing. And I want to show you how this minimization looks like. And for this, uh, in, the la in clustering, the edges are connections to the, to the 20 nearest neighbors. So we start off making each cell a, 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 a graph vertex, and then we connect each cell with its 20 nearest neighbors in PCA space. Important to notice here is that if you look at here, this histogram of graph degrees, you see that each graph has a each cell has at least 20 edges, but many cells have much more than 20 edges. How comes? Because typically, edges are not always mutual. Only because cell A is among the 20 nearest neighbors of cell B doesn't mean that cell B is also among the 20 nearest neighbors of cell A. And because of this, many cells have more incoming neighborhoods than outgoing neighborhoods. But because we make an undirected graph, so we forget about who was closest neighbor to whom, we get this here. So, uh, should I load this or should I just, uh, let's just go through this, otherwise I, yeah. Yes. Yes, there was in, early in the field there was a debate whether you are better off with a cosine metric or a Euclidean metric. But in the end, if you look at this here, at the, uh, here, you see, this was this, uh, con this was this plot of the first against the second PCA component. And you can already see, uh, we see sort of clusters here. And it feels natural to say these cells are similar or this, is a, uh, or this here is, is a trajectory and these are far off. And remember, when you judge this plot, you're using Euclidean metric internally. Of course, the mistake is that we look only at the first two. When we calculate our Euclidean, we also look at the, at the remaining 28 components that we have calculated, but all together, in that way, we, we get uh, this. The question is that is rather is this is not the Euclidean metric in the raw data. This is the Euclidean metric after doing our PCA, which is again after we did this log normalization, where we uh, took our counts and divided, uh, what was it, 
uh, here. Took all counts divided by the totals and then even made this, uh, this peculiar uh, log x plus 1. And that, of course, is not at all clear that this is. And you should, and uh, hardly anybody does that, but in my opinion, this, is, this should be considered as part of a matrix choice, the transformation we take from the raw data until we go into the PCA, of course, is, uh, maybe has more influence on our distance judgment later when the question whether you use now a Euclidean or an L1 or whatever now. Yes, that's, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about next time. What alternatives, especially to this strange pseudo-count adding in the logarithm there is. So, uh, here we have our clustering. And for this clustering, what we did here is, uh, I quickly go through it because we've already talked about this earlier. We make we use this nearest neighbor package, which finds for each cell its 20 nearest neighbors. And then we make a connection which says here cell one is connected to this nearest neighbor, cell two is connected to this nearest neighbor, where these are always the first nearest neighbors. Then I do the same for the second, third, fifth, sixth nearest neighbor, put this all into one long table and tell the iGraph package, now consider this as a graph. And I tell it, forget about which was from and which is two. So forget about this direction. That's what directed as far as means. And now I do this Leiden clustering, uh, which says find an assignment where the modularity is maximized. And uh, now let's have a look at what modularity actually means. So here is how our clustering looks like. And here the clusters are numbered. So you see each cluster has a number. And uh, we have used this to assign our cell types. Let's quickly switch over this. Eh, that's the wrong one. Want to, yeah, that's the one I wanted to look at. PCA, nearest neighbor finding, that's what we've, uh, what we've just done. Here we make the graph, exactly the same code we've just looked at, but this time in Python instead of R. Here is our clustering. And as I said, the Leiden algorithm, so here we called the Leiden algorithm, told it optimize the modularity, and it gave us here this assignment, cell zero is community zero, this cell is community four, community seven, and so on. And what we now do is the following, it has calculated something which is called the modularity score and has this value 0.852, and I wanted to know how has it calculated this. And then I spent about a day trying to recreate this calculation. And now after I spent a day, I of course have to show it to you. Uh, it later turned out that the whole was only me moving around uh, uh, factors of one half always to the wrong side. So what we are doing here is uh, to understand this is uh, I first uh, I've already told you what the number we are interested in is the number of edges which do not cross a boundary. So here in that case, all but one do not cross a boundary. I call this the within cluster edges, and I want to count them. So how do I do this? Uh, to make it easy for me, I uh, look at the matrix as an adjacency mat uh, at the graph as an adjacency matrix. That's one big matrix, a square matrix, where my, uh, my cells are both the rows and the columns, and the matrix either contains a zero or a one. So if cell I is connected to cell J, then the matrix row I and cell J contains a one, otherwise a zero. And because our graph is directed, we always have two ones for each edge, one at IJ and one at JI. So I tell R here, I want this adjacency matrix, and now I have this matrix. I check that this matrix works. Uh, first, I check that all the values in the matrix are either zeros and ones. I check that the diagonal of the matrix is all zero, because no cell is connected with itself. It could be, because uh, I go over, uh, because... 
I go over this, but at the beginning here, you remember each cell is connected to itself, but when I made my graph, I explicitly started from two. Maybe some of you have noticed this or remember it. No, I don't find the place, but I omitted this. So, and, sorry, where are we now? And uh, I also wanted to make sure that the matrix is symmetric. By transposing the matrix, subtracting the matrix from its own transpose, and checking that everything is zero then. Now, I take one specific cluster. Let's say the cluster number three. And I want to count how many of the, how many edges are there within cluster three, wholly within cluster three. What I do to this is actually quite easy. I have my full adjacency matrix. And let's say uh, these here are the cells in cluster three, and these here are the cells in, and, and these are the cells in cluster three, and maybe this is cluster one, and this is cluster, cluster four, or something like this. Then we notice that this part here is all the edges from a vertex in cluster three to a vertex in cluster three, while all the others are edges which are not in there. So I just say subset my matrix to only contain those rows and columns which are in cluster three, which I've done here. I told it, take only the rows. Here is member of, uh, where was I here? I is member of cluster are all those cells which are in cluster three. And here I say take all the rows which are in the cluster and all the columns which are in the cluster. And now sum them all up. And if I sum them all up, then of course I get the number of ones in there. As the matrix is symmetric, every edge has been counted twice. So I have to divide the whole thing by two. And now I have a number of clusters, a number of edges within this cluster. And I can do this for all clusters. So let's say here this is another cluster. And here is maybe the third cluster. And you see, in my drawing, these are blocks because I assumed that I have sorted my vertices by clusters. So first cluster one, two, three, and then these are blocks in the matrix. In practice, of course, my matrix is not sorted because I assigned the vertex numbers before I did the clustering. So I didn't know this, and I didn't bother to resort the matrix. So you have to imagine, uh, here in the code, it's unsorted here, it's sorted by clustering. Uh, to make it easier for me to draw. And now we can see all the edges that are within the cluster are the ones within these blocks, and all the edges which connected to different clusters are the ones outside these diagonal blocks. So all I want to do is to add all these ones in these blocks and divide it by the total number of blocks. And then I get this number I'm looking for, the number of edges which when the fraction of all the edges that are wholly within a cluster. And that's what I've done here. I took the same logic that I've just used here, again here, and calculated this and ran with my for loops for all the cluster. And now I add this up over all my 20 clusters and get this number of edges totally within. And now, of course, I want to know how many edges are there overall in my graph, and that's just the number of all the ones in my matrix. Again, divided by two because of the thing. And now we can divide these two numbers by it and can see 93% of all the edges are within the cluster, and only 7% of the edges are outside the cluster. So our Leiden clustering has done a good job of setting the cluster boundaries such that the cluster boundaries cut as few edges in half as possible. Now, if you used this as a target for optimization, if you would tell the Leiden algorithm, try to find an assignment that uh, optimizes, uh, that maximizes this number, what, would, what optimum would the algorithm come up with? Exactly, it will take one big cluster and say, Great, all the edges are within my cluster. That doesn't count. So we need to offset this with something uh, that uh, takes care of this. And the idea that the Leiden people had for this was that they ask 
given they ask how much is this number above what one would expect it for a random graph uh, with the same number of clusters and the same cluster assignments. It's not only important that the number of clusters stays the same, but also the sizes of the cluster. Because, of course, if I now tell the algorithm I want at least two clusters so that you can't cheat, then the algorithm will just find one single cell which has few neighbors and say, OK, this is my second cluster. Uh, that doesn't help. So uh, we say we want to compare with a random graph where the cluster structure is similar. Now, whenever in graph theory you talk about random graphs, you have to explain carefully how you want to randomize their graph. And the idea that they had in Leiden is that they say, we split all the, all the edges that we have in two halves. So that instead of edges, we have now what we call edge stubs. Each edge has been split into two stubs. And now we reconnect the stubs randomly. We take each stub and randomly connect it with a random other stub. The effect of this is that the edges change completely who is neighbor to whom. But what stays the same is the vertex degrees. Because each, each cell keeps its number of neighbors. It has the same number of neighbors before and after the suffering. Only which neighbors they are are different. And this, they say, is where what, they, what we call now, I think they called it an edge permutation. And uh, let's do this now to compare how many, how much, uh, what, a, what fraction of within edges would we expect if we random permute how these edge stubs are connected. So to do this, the first what I need to know is of course to have an easy way to calculate this fraction of edges within for a given graph. So I take this code that I've just done here and put it into a function so that I can simply say, here you take this adjacency matrix and this assignment of vertices to clusters and calculate this number and we again get our number. Uh, my suspicion is when I saved this yesterday, I didn't run the whole code again. Probably I changed something. Imagine these two numbers are the same. They were yesterday. <laughs> so, and now here I've just done this, this permutation fraction that I just told you. And now we want to do this permutation. And what we do is we tell Python to take the adjacency matrix and represent it as coordinate sparse matrix. Coordinate sparse matrix is something we've already seen earlier today, namely, at the very beginning, when we looked here at our initial uh, matrix thing, where we said in a in in the way how the cell ranger packet saves our count matrix is that always saves like this: row number thirteen, column number one has the value six. I want my and we do this only for the non-zero values. So I want my adjacency matrix. Where am I here? My adjacency matrix to be represented in this manner as a, as a, um, as a table of three columns, which I call row, column, and value. So I use this two coordinates function, which gives me this table with the three values, row and column, and data. The data are the values, and that's easy, of course, they are all one because the zeros are not printed and there is only zeros and ones. So I quickly check that they are really all one. Put an assertment here. So an assertion is telling Python, I expect that this is the case. In case I am wrong with my expectation, please tell me now. And after I've checked this, I can forget about this and assume this from now on. And now we only have these edges. And now you see how this looks like. Uh, vertex zero is connected to vertex 307. Vertex zero is connected also to 959. And at the last cell, 19098 is connected to that one. Uh, everything here is twice, of course, because we have the upper diagonal and we have the lower diagonal. And we can, we can uh, distinguish from what triangular matrix we are by checking whether from or two is higher. You see here. 0, 307, the row coordinate is smaller than the column coordinate, so it must be in the upper triangle. If it were the other way, it's in the lower triangle. 
oh, I tell this thing, I only want the upper diagonal. So only those entries where the form is bigger than the two. And then I say, okay, now remove from my table uh, all the lower diagonals so that we are only stuck with this. Now we have, now we have uh, our edge list and we have it only once. And now we do our edge shuffling, which turns out to be terribly easy. We just keep here the upper row as it is, take the lower row and permute it. I take a random permutation of the lower row. The lower row is an edge list too. Tell numpy I want a random permutation and now I get a new thing. And now I tell a thing, okay, I want a new permuted adjacency matrix. This new permuted adjacency matrix uh, for this, it wants my coordinates. And I say here, my coordinates are the form thing from before, the permuted two, and the values are all ones. And the shapes or the, the, the dimensions of the matrix, the number of rows and columns is the same as before. Now, because I have removed the upper diagonal, the lower diagonal, uh, I still have every edge only once, but now it's not a diagonal matrix because after the permutation, maybe it ended up on the wrong side. So what I have to do is to symmetrize the matrix by adding its own transpose so that we have every edge twice again on either side of the diagonal. And I have this new matrix, which now should have the exact the same number as once before, be symmetric, so a valid adjacency matrix, but it is edge permuted. But the vertices, i.e. the row and column sums of this matrix is the same as before. So we managed to, change, to permute our adjacency matrix such that the uh, row and column sums didn't change, but the, uh, uh, but the elements still did change. And now I give this to the function we had before, calculate the uh, adjacency matrix and the permuted adjacency matrix and the same cluster assignment as before. And we say, now the same cluster assignment only gives us 70.8% within cluster things. And this difference between the value we had before and the value we get now after permutation, that is the modularity score. And that is the thing that people, uh, uh, that, uh, people optimize. Now, in the big... We don't randomize the cluster assignment, and that's probably something that they, they thought quite a bit about it. It seems easier, but it turns out that if you randomize the cluster assignment, uh, you have this issue that uh, to be fair, you need the uh, plus, actually, uh, if we randomize the class, it's uh, how difficult the job of finding a good, uh, a, a good uh, community assignment is might depend a lot on uh, how the vertex uh, degrees are within your community. Maybe we have in our Facebook group, uh, this community is a community of everybody likes everybody, and this community is a community of, you know, loners, or people who are very selective with their friends, so that they all know each other only over corners. And now part of the way uh, to check whether our modularity score is good, we need to compare it with a null model that is equally difficult. And here this, of course, makes our thing a bit more difficult, because here we have a community with a high average vertex degree, and here we have a community with a low average vertex degree. If we now we commute the cluster assignments, then afterwards each cluster will have the same average vertex degree. While the beauty of this idea of permuting the stub connections is that the, uh, that the distribution of vertex degree within each cluster stays the same. That is at least my best guess of what their motivation were to define it this way around. Now, if we look at this, uh, if we look at uh, this uh, fraction here and subtract it, we get 0.8504, which is nearly the same as what, uh, what the graph modularity score has given us because the, the, the 
the, the iGraph package has said the modulated Cherry score is 0.8519. Who knows where the difference comes from? Yeah. Can we expect to get the exact same value? Exactly. Uh, we did only one permutation, and we should probably run it several times. So let's do this. I just put my, the code I just used to permute the adjacent matrix in a function, and now I can do 20 times permute them and calculate the fraction. And as you can see, it's always 0.8534. Actually, the modularity score people did something a bit more clever. They didn't run it several times. Because in order to optimize this thing, it would be very unfortunate if after each, op each uh, trial test, I have to run several permutations to see whether it got better. We should be able to calculate this modularity score analytically. And it turns out we can calculate this uh, null score analytically, and it's actually pretty easy. Because what we can do here is, I've written it down here. So let's uh, start here. We take one cluster and ask uh, how many degrees do we, uh, what is the expected value of uh, things in this cluster? And to do this, we go, if we want to know what is the expected number of within cluster edges for this cluster here, I can take some random cell I here and some random uh, cell J here and ask what is the probability that there is an edge between this and this. And to do this, I have Ki is, or oh, let's start the other way around. We take one specific step, that step here. So one step of graph of vertex i. And what is the probability that it gets connected to a specific other vertex j? And this probability is, of course, we have to ask how many steps are there in vertex j? And this is kj, the number of steps of vertex j, or the degree of vertex j, and we divide this by the number of stops we have in total, where m is the number of edges. The number of m is the number of edges in the whole graph, 2m is the number of stops overall, and one of these stops is the one stop we are looking at here, and this is all, and so there is 2m minus 1 stops left for this stop at vertex i to connect to. And uh, so this is the probability that the one vertex in the vertex i gets connected to vertex j. So and then we can ask, what is the expected number of connections between i and j? Now you might say, we expected there should be only be either one connection or zero connections. But in our permutation scheme, it could occasionally happen that two vertices get connected, that two vertices get connected with two edges. That's what we, technically this is not a graph, but a multigraph. A multigraph is a graph that allows for self-edges and for multiple connections between edges. And after our permutation, we might get a multigraph. We might get double connection. This should happen rarely if we have many vertices of small degrees, so or we don't really care about it, but it could happen. Uh, but it gives us the advantage that it now makes sense to talk about what is the expected number of connections between them. And of course, if this is the probability that we get a connection from a specific stop of vertex i, we have to multiply this by the, by the number of vertices 
kJ times kJ by the overall number of vertices. And when we get here, the expected number of connections should be ki times kJ over 2m. And if we sum up this expected number over all the vertices, all the vertex pairs that are in the same cluster, we get, uh, we, we get the expected number of connections within cluster. So, X. Oh, let's take here the other thing. So, the expected number of within cluster edges. We take a double sum ij and say ci is ga. So this here is a sum over all um, pairs of vertices that are in the same cluster. And for this, we sum up this stuff here. Where is it? Ki, Kj, dot 2m. Ki, Kj over 2m. And this sum, as I run, runs over all those vertices where the cluster of vertex i is the same as the cluster of vertex j. And just to be clear, I also write i smaller than j to make clear that each edge should only, uh, that each vertex pair should only be counted once. Uh, so ij and ji should be counted only once. And now this is the total expected number of edges within the cluster. And if we divide this now, I take this, ij, i smaller than j, and ki, kj, 2m, this time I write this here as a Kronecker date delta, but it means the same thing. Well, let's write it as we had it before. And I divide this now by the total number of edges. Then this here is the expected fraction of within cluster edges among all edges. And that's what we just done with our random permutation. The expectation of this random permutation is simply given by this. We run a double sum over all the vertices, skipping the vertex pairs which don't both sit in the same cluster, and just take ki minus kj over 2m. And I forgot this minus 1 here. And the reason why I forgot it is because m is typically in the thousands, so subtracting this 1 doesn't really make any effect. And hence, in the modularity score paper, they said they just like, omit it. So that thing usually gets kicked out. And if we do that, we get here, here I've written this formula again. I run all the vertices from i to m and the other vertex from j to m. Then I take here this probability, this expected number of things and divide it. And in the end, we get this formula here. I've written it a bit different on the board now than before, but I've written it here. So here I make this running sum where I run over all the vertices here and here to make, to be a bit more computational efficient if I now want to implement this. Of course, I don't make a sum which runs over all the vertices and then skip over those where this is not the case. What I do instead is I make an outer loop which runs over all the clusters and then within this cluster, I run over only those, make my double sum over only the vertices in it. This is the same sum, but um, of course written a bit differently and more efficient. 
And that's a typical thing that you often have, that, in, uh, that if you want to do such implement such things, that in order to understand what's happening, there might be one way how the formula is best written to understand, and another way how the formula is best written to implement and calculate it quickly. And here, you now see how I've done this. I made here my if loop to make sure that I count each only once. And I've decided to count the one where the first vertex number is smaller. And then I check what's the, uh, what's the uh, adjacency, what's the degree here, and what's the degree here. Where do I get the degree from? Here. I take my, I simply, uh, the degree is the number of edges of a vertex, and that's, of course, taking a row of the adjacency matrix and adding up all the ones in these rows tells me how many steps this vertex have. This is why here at the very beginning I calculate the row sum, or no, with the column sum, but doesn't matter because it's a metric. So for each column of my HAC matrix, I calculate the sum and thus gets the vertex degrees. Because I need the degree of the same vertex over and over, I do it before entering the calculation. And yes, as you can see here, I do this here and here. And now I uh, sum all these sums here up. And then I get here this, uh, the, this degree product sum, by which I mean the sum over degree product, which I now have to divide by this m, that m, and that 2. So I divide it by m squared and 2. And that's the point where I really mess myself up. I thought, OK, divide by m squared and then by 2. But of course, I had forgotten that the sum of all the entries of the adjacency matrix is not the number of edges, but twice the number of edges, because the matrix is symmetric. So I spent an hour figuring out why uh, it's that I forgot this ha missing half here. And now I get the exact value of a fraction within expected. And if I now uh, subtract this from our actual fraction within, the expected one, now this expected, 0.78, that is exactly the expectation value of all these permutations here. And if I now subtract the two, I get here 0.8519, which is the same as 8519, what the modularity score got. And the remainder here is some rounding errors. So here, this now puts this everything together, and now I have here this function which calculates for a given adjacency matrix and a given cluster assigned the modularity score. Now let's check whether Leiden has done a good job of finding an optimal one. So I take my clustering membership, call this the correct membership according to Leiden, and now I change it a bit by making a copy. Um, choosing a couple of, um, uh, choosing a, uh, what did I do here? Max membership times two or somehow. I don't understand my code here. Who can tell me what I did? Ah, I, this here, here is I chose within all the, uh, of all the vertices I have, I choose one, just to make one single change, and assign it to another cluster. To which cluster should I assign it? Well, I just take here uh, the number of all the different memberships. Now here we're falling in an annoying Python thing because the clusters are numbered 0 to n minus 1. I have to add 1 to get the number of clusters, and because choice also chooses between 0 and n minus 1, I have to add an, another 1, I think. Anyway, so I changed this, and it got a bit less here, 0 0.7 down to 0 0.1. And I run this at 20 times, and it always got less. Uh, the beauty of this formula that we have here is the following. What happens if I do such a change in assignment? I take one vertex and move it to another assignment. And it turns out you can easily calculate how the modularity score changes due to this. And this is because, uh, remember how we calculated the modularity score? Here is now the whole definition of a modularity score. So what we do here to calculate the modularity score, we go over all vertex pairs. We, over all vertex pairs which are in the same cluster, and we calculate for this vertex pair 
a one or a zero, depending whether the edge is, if we calculate a one, if the two vertices are connected in the actual current assignment. And this here is the expected number of connections which we have to them. And so this here, so this is the actual fraction. This is our expectation under permutation. We subtract them, we sum this up over all of them. This is how we can calculate the modularity score in one loop. Now what happens if I take, if I remove one assignment, then uh, to one cluster and move it to something else? Then uh, of course, let's say we change the vertex i from cluster seven to cluster nine. When we have to go to all the neighbors of I, so all the things which are connected there, well, let's draw this. So let's say we have a cluster. Uh, we have, this is our vertex I, and it's connected to that, 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 and that thing here. And now we are, have two possible cluster boundaries. The one cluster boundary says, should go like this. And the other cluster boundary says it should go like this. So essentially we say this is one cluster, that is one cluster, and we want and we first had this thing in the upper cluster, and now we move this thing to the lower cluster. What will happen? If we move this vertex from the upper cluster to the lower cluster, we have to remove these two edges and add these three edges. So the a, the sum over the a's, changes from two to three. So I just have to check, if I move this thing, I have to check how many neighbors did this thing have before in its own cluster, how many neighbors does it have after, and I know the, how the value of m changes, the left-hand value. And for the right-hand value, I just have to calculate, uh, go through the neighbors of a and calculate this chi ij first here and here, and then again I calculate it here. And in that way, I only have to look at these five values and only have to recalculate, uh, recalculate those parts of the sum of i's actual neighbors in order to see how m changes. And this is important for the, for, uh, the modularity score because the Leiden algorithm, in order to find its optimum, the primitive way, what you would do is you try an assignment, you run this whole formula. You try another assignment, you run the whole formula. But that would take ages because for every trial you have to run a double loop. However, because you know that any change of a single thing can be calculated with only a small thing, you can calculate, uh, you can update your score quickly without recalculating the whole loop. And in that way, what we do in the Leiden algorithm is that we just if I start with a random assignment, and then they take each vertex and say, let's try to put this vertex in that cluster, that cluster, that cluster, that cluster, always calculate how the score changes and choose the one which is highest. And then we do this with the next one and the third one, and once you end at the last vertex, you start from the beginning again. You do this until nothing changes anymore. Now this is what in computer science is called a greedy algorithm. A greedy algorithm is an optimization algorithm which always takes, uh, tries all possible small changes and chooses the best one. Greedy algorithms have a tendency to get stuck in local minima because they don't have any foresight. A, a choice which momentarily in, increases the score might block a way to something else. So this is why this greedy algorithm was for a long time considered a bad way to optimize the modularity. And people came up with all kinds of other stuff which went through the eigen, eigen decomposition of the JCC matrix and various other things. And then the Leiden people had a closer look and realized the problem with the greedy algorithm is it sort of works, but it gives many way to small clusters and then it's optimal because, it, because moving uh, something from one cluster to the other doesn't help anymore. But uh, merging two clusters might further increase it. So what they do is after I found an assignment of clusters like this, and say this is one cluster, this is the other cluster, and this is the third cluster, they say let's collapse this graph by saying this whole graph is now one cluster is one one vertex, this whole cluster is one vertex, and this whole cluster is the third vertex, and we make connections between them, and we 
make possibly multiple connections. If there is just for each edge which connects two different things, we make multiple connections. And then we run this greedy algorithm on that one again. And they could prove that running the greedy algorithm on this collapsed graph will actually further increase the modularity in the original graph. That's a clever thing. And in this way, they make this thing optimize with a greedy algorithm, collapse each found cluster into a one big cluster, and optimize again. I think three or four, but I've never really looked at it. Then uh, the people in Louvain came. So, you know, uh, the, uh, the crucial point is you have to be even somewhere in Belgium or the Netherlands to work on this, and your university has to start with L. So, people, uh, uh, the people in Louvain had a closer look and realized that the Leiden algorithm still runs into pathologies and sometimes even makes a cluster of two subgraphs which are completely disconnected and still end up in the same thing. And they came up with some look ahead to sort of uh, avoid it falling into the actual thing, uh, to, to fall into these things. And I've never quite understood how this Louvain improvement works, but it does make a little bit of better clusters. But none of these things are optimal. These are all heuristics. And because the computer scientists, being negative as always, have, uh, the theoretical computer scientists, I mean, have in the meantime proven that finding the optimal assignment is NP-hard, and hence we cannot hope to do better than the theoristics. Don't, for those who are not computer scientists, NP-hard is a complicated technical definition for actually uh, the fact that, no, we won't find the optimal solution in reasonable time. So, um, that was our little excourse in, uh, in, uh, in two details. Typically, if you were to learn single cell, uh, is if you were to learn single cell uh, uh, analysis for the purpose of doing biology, you wouldn't be interested in the precise dealings of a modularity score, or you wouldn't be interested in uh, how exactly we choose our highly variable genes, but I called the course Applied Mathematics in Biology, so now I wanted to jump into a couple of deep biology things. Also because it does help for biology in two aspects. Uh, the first is um, we want to improve these things. You might already have noticed that there is some, some uh, is, uh, issues here. For example, the fact that we do this clustering on the neighborhood graph and the neighborhood graph can sometimes be very misleading uh, because you might have a cell which is, you might have a group of cells which is here and you have a cell which is very far out. And of course, this cell, from the point of view of these cells, this wouldn't be a neighbor at all. But because this cell also needs to choose its 20 neighbors, it chooses these ones. And because the graph is directed, is undirected, we lose this information that the cell was actually very far out. It's, I think it's, uh, it was just a heuristic, a random guess. In practice, people always take 20. Because there are talk. Now, why would we take 20? Yes. Now, part of the issue is here. Yes, I always wanted to do something, uh, wanted to, to study this a bit. And I'm starting to realize why people, nobody does this. And to, sh to show you the first issue, this is, uh, that's a bit, one thing why we made the sleeve of tool to understand this a bit is here, take this thing for example. You have here, it's too small to read it, but these are T cells, these are monocytes, these are B cells here from some peripheral blood sample. And you remember my sleepwalk tool, I can put my mouse over this and I can see uh, all these cells which are close to. So the 20 nearest neighbor of this cell here it doesn't really matter whether I take 
20 or 50 or 100. They're probably all uh, equally close. Here, however, we see that there is quite some distance between this. This here, the 20 closest neighbors are much closer than the next 20 neighbors for some of these cells. While for these cells, they are all the other. The first thing that we can observe here is Here. One thing is, um, within my cell space, it might be that in one cluster, the cells sit like this, and within another cell space, the cells like, sit like this. And so originally, people tried a lot, and uh, so somehow the meaning of distance seems to change from cell to cell. While, so for example, here maybe we find something like actually two clusters, which are separated by this, and, what, and the distance which here separates two actual clusters separates here merely two cells, simply because the cells of this type are much more variable than the cells of this type. And that's really hard to then find a proper threshold. So what you might do is that you say, let's look at the local density cells at the place where we are, and just ask, how dense are cells here and are the cells here? And assume our distance threshold. We choose our distance threshold according to the local density. Now observe what happens when you do that. You Sit, take here a cell and ask, what is the local density of cells here? How would you best do that? You would look at a, at a couple of cells surrounding it and ask how far away away. You might look at the 20 nearest cells and ask how far away away to get a feeling of how dense they are. And here do the same. And then you say, let's take as my distance threshold uh, the distance of the average distance of the 20 closest cells. One thing that comes into mind here is uh, that is important to realize here, and which is non-obvious, is if I have something like this and draw this in 2D, you get a feeling that if I take an index cell, let's say we take this cell, uh, that uh, this cell differs in distance, like it's closer to that cell than to that cell. In 30 dimensions, this is no longer the case. Imagine you take, uh, you, uh, we take a, uh, we take a multivariate normal. Like, uh, I just do this like this, that the density of cells in X direction is normally distributed and in y direction is also normally distributed. It's just a blob like this. And I want to know what is the average distance of a cell to the origin here. And if I now draw my histogram of average distance to the origin, it should look like this. Distance to origin or to middle. A couple of cells are close. Most of them are mini. A few cells are sitting here close to it. Most cells are sitting here, an average thing. Many cells are sitting here. The crucial point is, this is for 2D, and this is how you imagine it, because everybody thinks 2D. If I do this in 30 dimensions, it looks like this. Uh, depends on who you ask. Uh, as we are doing statistics here, we call it what? Hmm? And we call it simply the central limit theorem. Why is it the central limit theorem? Look at what I've done here. I've asked, what is the distance to the center? So I ask you, take each coordinate, square it, and add them up, and take the square root. So what should the distance be? We take, render, we take 30 coordinates, which are all independently random, we add up 30 independently random things, of course, we get a, uh, a, a normal distribution. And well, let's actually calculate it because it is important. So we say we have a, we have a cell xi, and 
and the coordinate in the i-th dimension, so i is the dimension, and the coordinate is say zero, is norm, a standard normal distributed. So, and now I want to know what is the sum of x, i, and now I take the distance from the center, let's call this r squared. This is the distance from the center is this here. And now I ask, what is the expectation of r squared? Obviously, this is the expectation of this thing squared. And the expectation of a, so first we have to ask, uh, this is the uh, sum of the expectations of x i squared. Now, uh, a normal, if we square the normal, we get a gamma. Square of a normal is gamma, I think. And if we, and, uh, and it still has expectation one, if I'm not mistaken. So this here gives, this here gives n. So in this case, it's my 30 dimensions. And what is the variance of R squared? Again, the variance of, uh, of a square of this thing is, maybe it's one, maybe it's square root of two or something like that. Don't, do me, uh, don't uh, narrow me down on this, but it is the square of this, uh, before I say it wrong, let's quickly check it out. What the square root of uh, and I mistyped my password. No, it doesn't let me in again. No. Ah. Uh, not gamma, chi squared distribution. That's why it's called chi squared, because the chi is thought to be normal distributed. And chi-square distribution is exactly this thing here. You see, a chi-square distribution is the sum of k normally, standard normally distributed. These zi's are standard normal. We add them up and get this. So this q here is exactly my r-squared. That's why the chi-square distribution is so important. And then now we can read off here what uh, the mean of this thing is, it is n. That was correct. And what is the variance of this thing? It's 2n. Because the variance, when this thing has variance 1, its square has variance 2. We want to know why, ask Wikipedia. So the variance is 2n. So the standard deviation of this r squared is uh, square root of 2n. So as you can see, for uh, a chi-square, this year is the chi-square distribution for two degrees of freedom, and it's quite wide. If this is the chi-square distribution for 30 degrees of freedom, it has its mean at 30, and it has here a standard deviation of square root of 60-ish, what might this be? Seven something around seven. Oh, but this is of r squared, so uh, seven something. And let's put square roots over all of these because this was the radius squared and this is the radius. The point is uh, the width here is now much smaller than this. So essentially in a, in a multivariate standard normal, all points have roughly the same distance from the origin because each coordinate is independent. And if we draw them from independently from a random normal, some coordinates might be a bit larger, others might be a bit smaller. And the more dimension we have, the better this averages out. And the more we come to the conclusion that they all have about the same distance, not only the same distance to the origin, but also the same distance to each other which is very weird and counterintuitive, but it's the crucial point that in a standard, in a high dimensional space, such a ball of points, in such a ball of points, one always says all the 
mass lies on the shell. That's how the, me the measure people say it. And how in statistics we say the dis expected distance between any two points is roughly always the same. And this is an issue that we now have. Uh, and uh, how did we get to that? Well, we were asking about uh, why the 20 nearest neighbors. If they all have more or less the same distance anyway, it doesn't really matter so much whether we take the 10 or 20 or 30. Uh, it's more or less just a, if we want to know the density of points in this thing, we just take a small number of neighbors, big enough that we can reasonably well estimate the density, small enough that we don't leave the area of locally constant density, and say, okay, now we have a rough density. Now comes the next question about why 20 neighbors when we make our neighborhood graph. Because if, say, there is 100 points in these clusters, and all these 100 points have the more or less the same distance to themselves, and we pick 20 nearest neighbors, then it's essentially random which of these 100 points we pick as, as neighbors. And typically, and that's something I want to look a bit more into it, when we do this neighborhood graph, uh, we also make multi-hops. We ask who's neighbor of neighbor, who's neighbor of neighbor of neighbor. And because each one chooses 20 at random from this pool from 100, the moment you look at neighbors of neighbors and neighbors of neighbors of neighbors, you reach everybody. So you can say 20 is probably enough that from every cell you reach every other cell in the cluster within at most two or three hops. Because you probably see 20 squared is 400 and that's enough to reach all cells in the cluster unless the cluster has 10,000 then you might want to make a k a bit larger. But this is sort of a logic behind choosing k is 20. Yes, because of a, yes, and because of the presence of noise, we get this effect that choosing the 20 random, that, uh, which of a, where uh, you have a neighborhood of maybe 100 cells which have all approximately the same thing, and we choose 20 cells just as a representative sample. And we assume that if we go from one cell to the next, so, if we make this double hopping, and with a bit of thinking, you will realize that this is squaring the adjacency matrix. Once we square the adjacency matrix, we more or less get a connection from everything to everything else. Where we get to something else, we notice from this that this clustering, what we've done, another approach, how we can do this is to look at the powers of the adjacency matrix, and then the clusters appear of blocks, which is called spectral clustering. And we'll have a look at this too, I think. Yes, and it uh, depends on. I remember earlier I said this noise is, uh, where did I put this? It's gone already. The noise is counting noise. It comes from the number of reads we see. Now, how can we influence how many reads we get from a cell? It depends on first how many RNAs we actually recover from the cell. And this, at the moment, we might get 5 to 10% of all the RNA. We can blow it maybe up to 50%. But if you improve the capture rate by 10, you're only reduced by the noise by square root of 10, by a factor of 3, so the problem won't go away. Even if you would get all the clusters, all the reads in the cell, there's still an intrinsic Poisson noise in the cell, whether the cell has, 5, 000, has 326 or 328 RNA molecules of a specific gene, that probably doesn't tell you anything about the real biology. And in that case, uh, the Poisson noise is on the one hand the technical thing, but there's also intrinsic noise in the cells that we can't get over. So what we really want to do is solve the issue computationally by saying we, once we have identified which cells are sufficiently similar, we average over them. Because it's important to remember that in single cell sequencing, we are never interested in a single cell, despite the name, because a single cell is an anecdote. <laughs> 
In science, we don't want to tell anecdotes. We want to tell things about stuff which we see repeatedly. So we want to see repeated examples of the same cell. And we, our very purpose of always finding distances in neighbors is to find which cells which are sufficiently similar that we are justified to average over them. And it has to be good enough for that purpose. Okay, now I've talked two hours instead of the usual 90 minutes. Sorry about that. Hope it's okay. And let me know uh, exactly. Now you've seen this with these two possible directions we can go of either uh, of uh, either being more computational, more biological, more mathematical. I'll try to go back and forth, but you can tell me what you like more. <laughs> and otherwise, see you uh, next week. And now I will stop this recording and hope I save it this time, but